So I'm extremely excited uh, uh, to have um, one of my absolute favorite uh, scholars of 19th century Russian literature, um, a, a scholar with a very wide range of interests, including the fields of literature and science, literature and empire, the history of emotion, uh, and most recently, the concept of race in 19th century Russian literature and journalism. And uh, yeah, this is super exciting work that I'm really looking forward to, to what will come out of this project. Uh, among other things, Professor Sobol is currently one of the foremost specialists on Russian and literary and Ukrainian literary, literary relations in the United States. He has had the benefit of receiving her education in the key of Taras uh, Shevchenko University and Columbia University, where she received her PhD. And in addition to numerous articles on 18th and 19th century Russian literature, the first book, which I have here, is beautiful, Fabrice Erotica, um, Lovesickness in Russian Literary Imagination, explores the purpose of uh, lovesickness in Russian literature, in comparative and interdisciplinary framework with reference to contemporary medical discourse. Uh, she has also co-edited with Mark Steinberg, uh, an important volume in the field of Russian uh, history of emotion studies, uh, entitled, the volume is entitled Interpreting Emotion in Russia and Eastern Europe. And, uh, and most recently, and this is the uh, work that um, that is related to the presentation. Um, uh, uh, and hopefully, Mr. Sobel will mention, say a couple of things about the book as well. The uh, important and long awaited uh, book uh, on uh, called Haunted Empire, Gothic and Russian, and the Russian Imperial Uncanny. Um, yeah, so Professor Sobel's presentation today is related to her most recent completed book and entitled uh, A Ukrainian Voice in the Russian Empire, Pentelimon Polish, Polish's first novel and its reception. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Ilya, uh, for your very kind um, introduction. And I would like to thank the Jordan Center for the invitation and um, to the director of the center, Joshua Tucker, again, Professor Kligger for reaching out to me and to Sasha Spitalnik for taking care of all the logistics, including the uh, not so easy access to the building. <laughs> um, I consider New York City to be my American hometown, so to speak. Uh, this is where I immigrated in the mid 1990s. And as uh, Professor Kligger mentioned, that's where I received my graduate degrees at Columbia. I'm very happy to be back. Uh, my first visit since uh, from since the pandemic had broken out. So um, as I mentioned in the abstract, um, and as uh, Professor Kligger mentioned, this talk is part of my latest book, Haunted Empire Gothic and the Russian, Russian Imperial Uncanny. Uh oh, I can't switch slides. Um, nope. I have some kind of Zoom messages oh. here and I cannot go to the next slide, sorry. One second, just I got it. Oh, because I didn't accept the recording. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Now, yeah. Okay. Sorry. You told me to ignore all this Zoom message. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so ignore that one, the important one. Okay. So um, in this book, I try to establish and investigate a uh, connection between what is a purely seemingly purely literary mode, the so-called or literary tradition, Gothic mode, on the one hand, and the political, geographical, and historical context of the Russian Empire in which these literary works that made use of this mode were produced, and whose setting, the imperial setting, they often used. At that time, uh, and I'm dealing mainly with the pre-romantic and romantic period, 1790s through 1840s, um, Gothic fiction was tremendously popular across Europe, and Russian as well as Ukrainian literary works were full of Gothic tropes, such as haunted houses, transgressive passions, ghosts of the past, uh, to name ruins, to name just a few. And until a re relatively recent Gothic turn in Russian and Ukrainian studies, and um, many scholars have contributed to this, Catherine Bowers, Mirren Maguire, um, Svetlana Kris uh, for Ukrainian Gothic, and of course, um, um, Eric Nyman for, for uh, the Soviet Gothic. Um, 
So, but until then, I've seen too much scholarship that pretty much dismisses the Gothic element in these works as just a tribute to the fashionable trend. And of course, that was a Western European uh, literary development that the Russian Empire, um, or literature of the Russian Empire, kind of reflects with delays always, right? Um, it's kind of narrative, right, of, of, of uh, delay boring of Western uh, literary um, traditions or, or modes. And there is not much to, to it. But along with my colleagues um, in the work on the Gothic, I treat the Gothic mode quite seriously. I argue in my book that these Gothic cliches enact some of the most fundamental historical and cultural anxieties, and that they rise to a large degree from Russia's imperial experience, particularly the uncanny indeterminacy of, the, of Russia's borders, of its national and imperial identity, uh, of the boundaries between the colonizers and the colonized, the indeterminacy of all of that, the self and other, to give just a few examples, and that has been covered extensively by many scholars of the empire, historians and literary scholars as well. So I won't dwell on that. Um, in the case of the writers who have personal ties to Ukraine, and I looked at uh, a little bit on Vogel, but mostly Pogorelsky and Kulish, there was also Somov, um, and use Ukraine as an, an uncanny setting, the Gothic mode helps them channel the profound unease with, with which they confront the Ukrainian subdued colonial present as, a, uh, as opposed to its glorious um, kind of unique national past. Um, and I'll talk more about this today. My project, project is inspired primarily by two approaches to Gothic fiction, the imperial colonial Gothic on the one hand, and that was developed mostly in the studies of British uh, Gothic fiction, um, where it's pretty established uh, body of, of, of scholarship going back to the 90s at least, um, but it was barely investigated in the Russian imperial context. So on the other hand, I look at the imaginary geography of the Gothic, and this is something also that's been neglected uh, in many um, analysis of the Gothic, uh, that kind of geography and history often seen as mere paraphernalia, it's just kind of exotic uh, attributes, sort of uh, props, um, but um, as Robert Migal, a scholar of British Gothic fiction, reminds us, the Gothic, by definition, is about history and geography, and he refers to the term Gothic, which comes from the Goth, of course, the, uh, not the Goth, <laughs> today's Goth, but the, the tribe, um, the Germanic tribe that sacked Rome, and uh, which is, of course, marked geographically and uh, historically, and um, which at the time embodied the notion of, rather when the, um, the term appears, it's associated with the notion of darkness and barbarity. But ironically, these early associations of the Gothic with uncivilized barbarian, barbarian tribes would be reversed in the post-Enlightenment era. Um, I mean, the North-South, who's barbarian, who's civilized, the reverse, right? Rome is civilized, northern barbarian sack it. Later in um, late 17th, sorry, 1790s, right, or 80s, you see uh, that northern Europe, right, Britain, looks at South Europe, Catholic Europe, Spain, Italy, Southern France, as those sites of barbarity, medieval, like kind of Catholicism as they um, associated with medieval um, sort of backwardness and uh, superstition. And the Protestant North displaces as it were the horrific, the irrational and the transgressive into the Catholic Southern setting um, that also embodies the dark past that the North has supposedly overcome successfully. So for my own project, I decided to test how the Gothic North and South, North South axis would work in the Russian imperial context. Obviously, we don't deal with the Protestant uh, Catholic uh, uh, tension here, but something else is going on. And also, it gave me an opportunity to move away from the East and West Saidian paradigm that's very productive and sometimes overlaps with North East and North South, but is, has been much more privileged in, in uh, Russian studies. So. In my book, I fo focus on uh, two regions. Uh, nor the North is the Baltic regions, kind of loosely Scandinavia or Finland, um, and uh, Ukrainian South. And I'll explain why about Ukraine in a minute. Um, so view them essentially as spaces of internal otherness, not completely exotic and alien like the Caucasus, which would be maybe more um, um, kind of traditional <laughs> place of the South, but those that are uh, site of like Russian South, but those are that part of Russia's own narrative of origins. And because the concept of the unca uncanny also is very important to my, to my work. Um, so relatively late additions to the Russian empire, both regions retained an aura of exoticism in spite of their domesticated colonized status. 
both Scandinavian and Baltic North and Ukrainian South are part of Russia's own mythology of origins, invoking the legendary Varangian provenance of the Russian uh, ruling dynasty on the one hand, among other things, and the cradle of Islamic Orthodox Christianity, Kiev and Rus, right on the other. In the Russian cultural imagination, they represent others as a paradoxically integral, integral to the national and imperial self, again, as we see so clearly today. And uh, so there is something un uncanny, <laughs> so to speak, in the Freudian sense almost about that, uh, those, those territories. And if you want to see how this unfolds in the book, uh, and basically in the introduction, I talk about Lermont of Stamine as that kind of uh, key text of the <laughs> Russian imperial uncanny. And the trajectory of, of Pechorin actually is going from north to south, from St. Petersburg to the Caucasus, but that stop in Tamine in the uh, frontier of territory, which is still Russian, right? Uh, the little ugly <laughs> uh, sort of, uh, town in Russia, uh, he encounters those Ukrainian speaking <laughs> locals and these confusing identities and even physical disabilities. And uh, it kind of embodies that kind of um, sense of the anxiety, sense of loss and danger that Russian, those evasive borderline territories uh, represent to that kind of imperial subject. Um, and I have, as is, you know, an article about it and, and, and you can read about it in the intro to the book. But um, just given everything that's going on currently in the world, I would like to say that when I started this project about 10 years ago, I honestly did not expect it to have any relevance to, to the current political events. In fact, I was always a bit cautious and kind of cautious about writing literary scholarship that has political undertones or, or direct or indirect political um, message or relevance. I just wasn't comfortable. I don't know, I should blame it on my Soviet um, um, school bringing or, or something else. Uh, but I thought I had a safe project that was kind of, not safe, but it's set in 19th century remote, right from the present day, which uh, uh, investigates right those, the imperial culture of the time but doesn't have any immediate political relevance. And then in 2014, the Ukrainian Maidan revolution happened, followed by Russia's annexation of Crimea and the war in Eastern Ukraine. And many of us, I'm sure, experienced the sense of a Gothic nightmare, but also painful recognition of the all too familiar tropes of or imperial discourse of barbarism, chaos, primordial territories, kinship, historical ties, and so on. And I included these thoughts into my conclusion to the book, which came out in 2020. So I was writing this in 2018, probably. And I was wondering, gosh, it's going to be so dated very soon. And as we all know, unfortunately, this was not the case. And little did I know that the, the image I chose for my book, Verishagin's Apotheosis of War, um, just to evoke the idea of horror and empire um, would become relevant not only during the pandemic, but even more poignantly now. Um, it was my intention, but um, and even, um, yeah, um, history caught up with me, as, as, so to speak. And not just in connection to Ukraine, as you recall, Putin compared himself to Peter the Great uh, not so long ago, uh, speaking precisely about the Baltic and fin uh, Finnish territories, uh, talking about how Russian Empire never uh, invaded, but re was returned, always returned their territories. And he specifically mentioned St. Petersburg, which was built as a, on a just recently next Finnish territory um, during the Russo Swedish wars and uh, talking about extension to the Baltics where East Slavs and uh, Finno Greek and Baltic people coexisted uh, for a long time. And uh, I was just shocked how much of this rhetoric I've seen in a less blatant way, but underlying the Gothic narratives of, um, the early 19th century, including uh, by very progressive, in other ways, <laughs> Decemberist writer, future Decemberist writers who wrote about Livonia in the 1820s. So, but today we'll turn to Ukraine and to the fascinating figure of Pantelimon Kulish, Pantelimon Kulish, whose first novel is the subject of uh, the last chapter of my book, and also Slavic Review article. So, if you um, want to see more detailed analysis of the novel. Since Kulish is little known outside of Ukrainian studies, and honestly, he was known in Ukraine, mainstream Ukrainian culture uh, during the Soviet time when he was persona non grata, he was considered bourgeois, bourgeois nationalist. And unlike Taras Shevchenko, he was never part of any curricular um, until the Ukraine, Ukraine's independence. Um, 
and yeah, now he's given his due, but uh, still little known outside of Ukrainian uh, specialists. Let me say a few words about his biography. I'll only stress a few important moments, not to take too much time. Here's one of his many photographs. It's a long life relatively for the 19th century, so I won't <laughs> dwell on all the details. But um, he was born into a Cossack family in the Chernihiv Gubernia, Gubernia uh, growing up with um, an illiterate mother who, and quite educated father, and, and the mother instilled the love of, for Ukrainian folklore. He was a good singer uh, in him. But then he starts a gymnasium in Ogorod Siversky and um, kind of has more of a Russian uh, educational uh, influence. And then he kind of develops again a deep passion for Ukrainian culture. Uh, this is a second bullet point. I wanna comment on this briefly. Under the influence of Maximovich's collection of Ukrainian folk songs that came out in 18, 1834, and later in his memoirs about his friend, uh, histor Ukrainian historian Kostomarov, Kulish describes this moment in striking terms as a kind of moment of almost mystical conversion. He said that both uh, Kostomarov and I were uh, at the time kind of more Russo, Russo files, and he said, uh, and neglected all things Ukrainian. Um, but uh, and thought in the language of Pushkin. After reading these songs, he said, "In one day, in different parts of Ukraine, from we, we were transformed from Great Russian, Velikoruski Narodniki, into Little Russian <laughs> Narodniki, which is translated differently as populist or nationalist, right, Narodnik." So this was a key moment. Um, he enrolls in Kiev University, right? As I said, didn't complete the course. Um, after that, he teaches at Lutsk and Kiev, and that's when he works during his studies in Lutsk. He, um, sorry, work in Lutsk, uh, he writes that first novel in Russian, Mikhail Chernyshenko, Little Russia, 80 years ago. Um, so while in Kiev, um, after his university years already, he befriends Taras Shevchenko and Mikola Kostomara, uh, as well as some Polish intellectuals. And that friendship with Shevchenko Kostomarov will have pretty serious <laughs> repercussions for, for Kulish's later life. Um, uh, it was a great, of course, enriching uh, personal relationship, but um, at the time they were forming a circle uh, which will become a secret society of Cyril Methodius society. Um, and I'll, I'll explain the implications of that um, later, but it was basically a secret society, which is 1840s was not a good thing, as you know, in, in Nicholas's Russia. Um, and they sought political reforms based on Christian moral principles, um, primarily equality, social and economic equality, and envisioned a kind of pan-Slavic federation led by Ukraine. Um, so, but before the society was officially really began, began to function, uh, uh, Kulish moves to St. Petersburg, where, where, of course, he saw the more opportunities for his career, becomes close to Plitnyov, the editor of Sovremenik and the um, rector of, of uh, St. Petersburg University. And he writes his uh, second novel, The Black Council, Chornarada, in both Russian and Ukrainian, and published the Russian versions, parts of it, in the contemporary. The importance of this is that when he publishes much later, oh, not much later, like about 12 years later, the Ukrainian version of it, it becomes the first Ukrainian uh, historical novel um, in history. <laughs> so very important. Okay. So he marries... Um, his um, 1847 is another year I want to dwell on. It looks great at first. Uh, Kulish marries um, Alexandra Bilozerska, his uh, friend's uh, sister. Sorry, and um, more more importantly, well, not more important. Sorry, career wise, uh, he has great prospects because Plitnyov. Um, is very impressed by Kulish, and at the time, a professorship opens up at, at St. Petersburg University of Slavic, Slavic philology, of Slavic languages, professorship. So apparently, you didn't, did, did not need a PhD for that at the time, or a university degree. <laughs> Kulish was well educated, but he didn't have a formal, uh, didn't complete formal studies, but he promises to Kulish, but Kulish has to study those languages other than Russian and Ukrainian in Europe, and he sent the St. Petersburg Academy is sending him on a three-year uh, trip abroad for that, um, uh, with that purpose. And um, while he's in Warsaw, on the way to Western Europe, Warsaw is still the Russian Empire. Uh, the, some, an informant 
report on the Cyril Methodian Brotherhood and all its members are arrested. So Kulish, <laughs> if, if Poland wasn't part of Russia <laughs> at the time, he would have been fine, but he is still within the uh, Russian um, imperial borders. And he's, instead of continuing his wonderful trip, he's arrested and brought to Peter and Paul um, fortress in, in St. Petersburg. So that was a huge blow, of course. And he is exiled to Tula for three years, then uh, gets kind of forgiven uh, um, and is allowed to move uh, back to other places, but he is not allowed to publish under his own name and not allowed to work uh, in educational um, institutions. Then finally, after the death of Nicholas I, um, he is restored, um, his rights are restored, but it was like a very traumatic moment. And Shevchenko, of course, paid the, the highest price, uh, as, as many of us know, uh, exiled to, to Kazakhstan. Um, so, As you see, he works on Google's biography and first complete works edition of Google and becomes very close with Russian Slavophiles. Um, and I'll skip, oops, sorry. I'll skip um, some of the other uh, facts that are listed here. And in general, it's a very, very, of course, short and schematic um, summary. But I want to mention the Hutarians to the last point. So he, uh, for the, a lot of, most of the year, later years of his life, Kulish lives on his hutir, or hutar, uh, right, homestead, Matronivka, um, interrupted by occasional trips to the West and holding positions in Poland. Uh, and he becomes a proponent of hutarians to the kind of Rousseauian idea of the hutir, uh, hutir as a uh, moral and spiritual center. And uh, that's where he dies uh, on that hutir in 1897. Um, so just a brief summary of his accomplishments and paradoxes. Um, as you can see, well, he's not only the author of the first Ukrainian historical novel, the first biographer of Gogol. Um, he's translated significant parts of the Bible and some Shakespeare into Ukrainian. There's a very uh, detailed and really excellent study by Andriy Danilenko about, uh, in English, about Kulish's translations as a kind of uh, project of his shaping the Ukrainian literary language as both based on the vernacular at the same time part of the wider European um, cultural project. Um, and he also calls him Ukrainian Maverick, which uh, I like that uh, the definition very much um, because he was, um, he had a lot of paradoxical ideological views as you can see on this list. Um, and I mentioned the last one because it's kind of key to my analysis today, his idealization of Ukrainian Cossack Dom on the, way, on the one hand, which he later viewed as a chaotic, destructive kind of barbarian force. But I kind of found that hesitation even earlier in Kulish's uh, first novel. And I think it's been kind of an ongoing obsession, um, how to reconcile that Ukrainian past, it's so colorful, so heroic, so nationally distinct, right? It's something that Ukraine had before it became part of the Russian empire and it's full of this, you know, it's a source of all this wonderful folklore and heroic narratives, uh, but also um, how to reconcile it with the uh, Ukrainian current state as part of uh, this, part of this kind of enlightened, <laughs> enlightened empire that's supposedly can bring it closer to the sort of this Western idea of acculturation that was so important for Kulish. So, um, and, but which was also break up with that past, right? So kind of give up that unruly, chaotic uh, part of your identity to become part of the modern uh, civilized force. So, and I think he and many other Ukrainian romantics I think struggled with, with, that, with that paradox. In his biography of Kulish, George Lutsky stated, I quote, it is Russian-Ukrainian coexistence, which proved to be the central dilemma of his life. And as I mentioned, an important aspect of this dilemma was the conflict between Kulish's romantic fascination with the Ukrainian heroic past and his rich folk traditions on the one hand, and on the other, his deeply held enlightenment values and belief in high culture, which he associated with Russian and sometimes Polish influences. And at the level of ideology, this conundrum translated into split between his ideals of romantic nationalism and his alignment with the dominant imperial culture. He actually wrote a work where he says that Ukraine joining Russia was a good thing, right? That it brought Ukraine into the kind of more civilized uh, order. Um, so, and um, 
as I said in my uh, analysis of his no early novel, I argued that that was a kind of persistent problem for him from early on, and I. <laughs> I'm obviously biased to the Gothic uh, mode, but I, I believe that this paying attention to the Gothic stratum of the novel really yields um, kind of insight into this paradoxical uh, position and complex views. Okay. Oops. Um, in 1846, St. Petersburg-based journal, the Finnish Herald made a call for Ukrainian Walter Scott. Um, it was, in con was not in connection to Kulish, but um, the interesting coincidence here. Little Russia, Malorossia for Russia in a literary sense is the same as Scotland is for England. It is awaiting, it's Walter Scott, awaiting him with love and will be able to give him his due appreciation. Well, they didn't know that Ukrainian Walter Scott had already <laughs> entered the literary scene. That was Pantelimon Kulish, who was often compared by his friends to Walter Scott, who clearly uh, fashioned himself as Walter Scott. And whose first novel, as you see from the title uh, here, um, kind of um, mimicked <laughs> the, the title of, of Walter Scott Waverly novel. So his letter to Pagodin, the same year, interestingly, that, um, that uh, quote from the, the review from Finnish Herald came out, again, without any connection to it. Kulish writes, um, he was maintaining a close correspondence to Pagodin, right, the prominent Russian Slavophile, and he's writing from St. Petersburg. My life is not too bad. However, I do miss little Russia. I want to go there in the summer, but everybody finds it extremely silly. I agree, but what in this intelligent city, he puts intelligent in, uh, but umnam gora in, in, in italics. Well, he didn't like Saint Petersburg. <laughs> <laughs> Will replace for me my native language and the views of my home country. Walter Scott was not insincere, ni mutil, when he told Washington Irving, "I die if I would not see it, Scotland for a long time." Um, so he clearly um, thinks of himself as, as a Walter Scott, um, and he. Um, made that claim, as I said, with his first novel, Mikhail Chernyshenko, Little Russia, 80 years ago, that was published in Kiev in 1843 in Russian, but with a very uh, sub substantial um, inclusion of uh, Ukrainian and Serbian uh, linguistic elements. And the title obviously mimics, as I said, Scott's, Scott's Waverly or 60 years since. The novel is long and kind of convoluted, and this is by... Mm, by no means a complete <laughs> summary or cast that's much, much bigger. I'll just name a few, uh, again, main facts and especially historical background, which is kind of interesting. So 40 years ago, uh, relatively to 1742, when he was working, the novel takes us to, correct math? No. 80 years ago. 80 years, sorry. Right, of course. I'm right. 80 years ago, whew, I think, <laughs> um, takes us to 1762. And this is the setting of um, Kulish's novel and specific event that kind of moves the plot is that uh, strange idea of a military campaign <laughs> by Peter III, right? Whose reign was very brief, uh, who was then murdered as a, as a result of the coup organized by Catherine uh, the Second supporters, right? But his idea was to restore the Schleswig region, uh, which is kind of Denmark, um, to his German Holstein Gotterb duchy. I put it on the slide because I think it's hard to <laughs> pronounce the process. But um, so he basically wanted to attack Denmark to get this territory back. Um, and uh, according to the source that Kulish used extensively, but one of many sources for his novel, uh, History of um, Rus, um, the History of the Rus, or Little Rush, Historia Rusov, Ili Male Resi, Peter formed the Ukrainian Cossack Regiment for his army, where young people were lured or recruited by the recently converted, calculating Jew, uh, Colonel Krzyzanowski. Um, and um, the novel, the novel's title protagonist, Mikhail Chernyshenko, uh, who is like, obsessed with uh, like old Cossack glory, he joins the Cossack recruits in spite of the objections of his father. And the hero's disobedience of his father's ban on serving in the Russian army causes this a split between this father and the son, this kind of generational conflict. And eventually, when Mikhail unintentionally burns down most of his father's house, another important moment, um, the old Chernyshenko, and denounces and curses his son. And we have this kind of Gothic her curse, right? The curse um, 
that then um, sets in motion a whole series of misfortune for the protagonist. Uh, his capture, but but by bloodthirsty exotic Serbs who somehow pop up in the middle of Ukraine. Um, the tragic death of uh, Mihailo's beloved Katerina, who's killed by his passionate new Serbian lover, Roxana, and Mihailo's own death, followed by his father's demise 10 years later, basically everybody dies. <laughs> but there's many, many adventures in between that I skip over. There are more Serbian characters. There is two Cossack, interesting characters that travel with Mihailo. So it's quite a, quite a drama. Um, and obviously, I can't, in that presentation, I've already been speaking a lot and haven't even gotten to, to the novel. I cannot focus on all the aspects of this fascinating text. I'll just uh, uh, comment on a few important uh, moments here. What exactly is at stake for Kulish in adopting the Walter Scott and temporality the 80 years ago? Some scholars have claimed that the historical setting in Kulish's novel is not significant per se, Rather, the military campaign serves here as essential pretext to get the hero out of the house, as it were, to send, uh, make him leave the parental home and embark on his adventures. And that's a typical dismissal of the importance of the historical setting uh, in Gothic um, novels, right? Uh, but I would argue that the choice of this rather obscure historical episode is strategic on Kulish's part for at least two reasons. First of all, the very irrelevance of this military campaign to the Ukrainian subjects of the empire, right? They have to serve the empire to going from south to north this time to, to, to fight. Um, the campaign, by the way, never materialized, right? Because Peter didn't have time to, uh, like it, they started the preparation, then he was killed and Catherine um, entered the throne and that was it. Um, but the very irrelevance of this military campaign to the Ukrainian subjects of the empire enables Kulish to question his young protagonist, Mikhailo's uncritical and historical acceptance of the heroic ethos of the past. Secondly, it allows the writer to set his novel just on the eve of the reign of Catherine II. I was told by my reviewers to take out great <laughs> from my article draft. And I think it's a good, because uh, her role in Ukrainian right, history is very, very um, not so great. Um, so in during this reign, any remnants of Ukraine's autonomy within the Russian empire that it's still preserved when it was uh, added in the late 17th century, but during her reign, everything would come to an end with the abolition of the Hetmanate in 1764 and the raising of the Parisian siege in 1775. Um, so it's this kind of moment on the eve of the disappearance of Ukraine as a more kind of autonomous, distinct presence within the imperial uh, context. In the concluding chapter, Waverly Scott explains that it's Scotland's loss of its unique culture and autonomy in the aftermath of the suppression of the Jacobite uprising um, that set him uh, to quote, the task of tracing the evanescent manners of his own country. As made clear in the opening of Mikhail Chernyshenko, Kulish pursues a very similar goal of reconstructing a national life that has vanished, if not without a trace. It is above all the ideological subtext. So, you know, you talk about like Ukrainian Walter Scott, everybody wants to be like Walter Scott, he's very popular, but for Kulish and for I think the Ukrainian context, it had particular relevance because Scotland, when, when this reviewer said Scotland, Ukraine is to Russia in the literary sense as Scotland is to, England, he meant something else, right? Exotic kind of land with its own unique folklore, but politically, right? It also, the parallel is very um, um, important. And I believe that this, this ideological subtext of Waverly, it's relevant to the Ukrainian situation, the historical political parallel between Scotland's absorption by England and Ukraine's dissolution in the Russian empire that attracts Kulish to the Scottian model, in addition to the general romantic and ethnographic appeal. So what is Kulish's little rush of 80 years ago? I won't read the whole <laughs> quote, but you can look for yourself. It's its its own distinct life, right? This Narodna uh, poetry, costumes, uh, memory of uh, recent um, heroes, the existence of the Parisian siege. And then at the end, you see after the brackets in my quote, he says with this kind of um, lyrical nostalgic Tone. Немного кажется, лет прошло со времен последнего гетманства, но между тем, как изменилась Малороссия. Если бы мы могли перенестись в те времена, нас окружил бы совсем иной мир. And this entirely different world of the Ukrainian past includes predictably the authentic clothing contrasted with the contemporary westernized dress, the pure Ukrainian language as opposed to the current barbarian one, 
as he calls a mixture of Russian and Ukrainian poetic folk songs, and it's ma magic, divine, heroic history. He has a lot of those worlds of, of vocabulary of, mad, of kind of supernatural, uh, magic, uh, miraculous, and so on. Um, but the, this world is presented as irrevocably lost. И вы не можете не призадуматься над судьбой этого необыкновенного народа, который явился чудесным образом, как роскошный цветок посреди враждебных для него стихий, блеснул необычайным блеском славы, дал о себе знать целому свету, но не достало в нем сил для кипучей жизни, он склонил голову преждевременно. Он исчез как сверхъестественный признак, призрак, sorry, как сверхъестественный призрак почти перед нашими глазами. In other words, the 80 years ago refers to the last period of Ukraine's relative political autonomy, and most importantly, its cultural and national specificity before its often fraught assimilation of Russian imperial culture. Essentially to the moment before the death, or as Kulish puts it in more Gothic terms, the ghostly disappearance of, an, of the nation. However, as the quote above suggests, the go this ghost-like disappearance is closely linked to the Narod, the nation's no less elusive and phant phantasmagorical appearance. Uh, the nation's very existence thus is so brief and fleeting that it acquires a quasi-supernatural quality. Kulish, however, attempts to capture this ghost, to reconstruct this forever lost world through studying its folklore and ethnographic evidence. And Kulish's antiquarian project of the restoration of the historical past is a recognizable anti-colonial, anti-imperial nationalist strategy identified by scholars of the British Empire, most notably by Katie Jumperner, right, in her Bardic nationalism. And the fictional storyline of Mikhail Chernyshenko is accompanied by an impressive scholar of the apparatus, Kulish was also an ethnographer, um, with extensive ethnographic and historical notes and citations of documentary sources. At the same time, as we have seen, Kulish persistently refers to the Ukrainian autonomous past as a ghostly, phantasmagorical bygone era. And it's not just a list of register, right? I think it's like two, two ways of um, dealing with uh, temporality um, and um, was the kind of the, the reconstruction of the past or rather construction of the past maybe. And these two seemingly conflicting temporalities, antiquarian or historic on the one hand and fantastic uh, on the other are expressed in the novel by two Gothic modes, what I term the Walter Scottian Gothic and the supernatural Gothic. And the Walter Scottian Gothic is more associated with medieval uh, themes, uh, castles, uh, Gothic architecture, towers, medieval illusions, ruins, but uh, the fantastic or supernatural Gothic is uh, expressed through um, the imagery of ghosts and apparitions, folkloric motifs and infernal forces. And the interplay of various Gothic traditions in the novel and contributes, sorry, contributes to Kulish's complex portrayal of Ukraine, which seems gone, but not quite, right? You can kind of have all the documents and all the um, ruins and, and architectural remnants to, to reach this past, but at the same time it's past is a ghost, it's something intangible, it's something uh, completely <laughs> from a different uh, transcendent plane. And um, so the result, like a ghost, right, at the same time alive and dead, present and absent, historically specific and atemporally symbolic, belonging to the past and yet haunting the present. This is the Ukraine of Kulish's novel. And this different attitude to the past, uh, in fact, also at the heart of the conflict between uh, Kulish's father and oh, <laughs> Mikhail's father and, and the hero, the gener generational conflict is about different relations to the past. Um, because the elder, the elder Chernish, Mikhail's father, retired from service and dedicated himself to collecting, to basically antiquarian activity, collecting Ukrainian songs, legends, chronicles, and other remnants uh, of antiquity. Uh, but he's aware that I quote, little Russia has already lived its term, a Jalavis Vovyek, and he's skeptical about trans transferring this heroic ethos of the past into the contemporary historical setting. And this is why he discourages his son to join the army and follow, um, especially the corrupt imperial army, if he sees it, and strongly supports his son's civil career. Um, thus, he acknowledges the irreversibility of time, and to quote Svetlana Boim, right, the otherness of his object of nostalgia from present life and keeps it at a safe distance, precondition for romantic nostalgia, um, according to Boehm. Mikhail, by contrast, fails to acknowledge the otherness of the past, violates this distance, and attempts to reenact the heroic past of Ukraine in its imperial present. And it causes all kinds of <laughs> problems for the hero. But as we recall, it is not just his dis disobedience about the service in the army that causes the fateful curse. 
but his uh, burning of his father's house, right? That really, um, that's when things go <laughs> downhill for, 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 for the protagonist. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this house because obviously it's, it's a primary gossip trope, right? A haunted house or a castle, a site of memory, a site of a history. Um, and um, interestingly, it was intended uh, to be an exact by Mikhailo's ancestors, as we learn from the novel, to be an exact replica of Bogdan, Bogdan Khmelnytsky's house, right, the, uh, in Subotiv, the Hetman's residence and hypothetical birthplace. And uh, Mikhailo's father at some point happened to come across a draft of Khmelnytsky's house and succeeded, this is Kulish as I mentioned, and recon succeeded in re re reconstructing that house. Um, and look, for example, how the gate leading to the house is described. And this is the pictures from other parts of Ukraine, but it has a kind of Gothic ruin uh, feel. So Varota is dealing with Dubova Dereva. So Mikhail arrives at his parents' house, and yeah, and the gate is, is described through abundant Gothic references invoking medieval past of nightly battles. And actually, the um, Kulish was very keen on portraying um, Ukrainian Cossacks as an, an, an analogs to Western European knights. Uh, that's a common theme in both of his novels. Uh, but even more importantly, the gate is presented as a fragment of a ruin, so kind of a double ruin, even before the house is destroyed by fire. So Varota, it is dealing with Dubovo Dereva, Pachernevsha at Bremeni, были так высоки и огромны, имели на себе столько крови, решеток и самых неразгаданных для антиквария украшений из резного дерева, что казались обломком готической башни, уцелевшей от какого-нибудь готического замка, а покрывавшей их со всех сторон мох и дикие травы довершали это сходство. While critics have interpreted Kulish's recurrent allusion to Gothic, allusions to Gothic architecture as an influence of translated Western novels, I contend that this description points to the symbolic function of the house as a ruin in, the, in its 19th century sense, as discussed, discussed by Peter Fritsch, my colleague at Illinois, um, in his Stranded in the Present, his book, right, Stranded in the Present, Modern Time and the Mel Melancholy of History, Fritzsche argues that while in the 18th century, the ruins invoke the generic European cultural legacy, universal set of meanings and continuity between the past and the present, in the 19th century, they began to signal a tem temporal rupture between the imperial present and the a unique but never fully accessible national past. And while Fritzsche theorizes ruins using the case of Germany in the wake of French Revolution and during the Napoleonic Wars, I believe his conclusions applied to Kulish's Ukraine under Russian dominance. The rift between the past and the present is particularly dramatic for Kulish, for Ukraine is portrayed in the novel as we saw earlier, essentially as a ghost, a nation with a rich, a fleeting past, but no present. The burning of the house thus symbolically dramatizes the coming rapture and turns the building literally into modern ruin. Uh, so when the houses burn, that's already a ruin, right? But there is no going back. There's no going back to the times of Bogdan Khmelnytsky. There's no time to there's no way of going back to um, the, um, uh, the, the, the Cossack glory. And what is interesting kind of eerie is that um, the time period that comes after the death of Bogdan Khmelnytsky in Ukrainian history has a name Ruina or Ruin uh, because it was such a chaotic time with various fractions, uh, you know, fighting for uh, dominance in Ukrainian politics, different Cossack hetmans, divisions between left bank and right bank Ukraine. And Kulish, this is the subject of Kulish's second novel, the major, more acclaimed novel, The Black Council. So, um, yeah, the, the, I think the idea of a ruin uh, develops at, at many uh, levels in, 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 in his work. Um, and it's also, I would argue, connects the two ostensibly separate temporalities and Gothic modes in the, in the novel. And at, so the Gothic ruin is an antiquarian fragment of the historical past, right? A piece of material evidence about the bygone time, but it also requires ghostly, fantastic connotations because of the seemingly insurmountable gap between Ukraine's colorful autonomous past and its subdued present. And yet paradoxically, because of the presence of the ruins, both literal and symbolic, this past never fully recedes, just as ghosts reappear to haunt the sites of national traumas. In fact, Fritsch explicitly, explicitly compares ruins to ghosts, as I quote, the residue of historical disaster, as well as quote, testimonial power to speak through history. And um, there is a later scene in the novel where Kulish appeals precisely to this testimonial power of ruins. At some point, he describes an epic battle between militant Serbs and local Ukrainian lords. 
and wonders what will the readers think? How can the modern reader, modern means 1840s, right? Believe that um, in Ukraine, just 80 years before such kind of crazy <laughs> chaotic things could be happening, this kind of epic battle with bloodshed and so on, when Ukraine was already part of the uh, Russian empire. And that's what he says. And that's one of the few like, direct intrusions of the authorial and narratorial voice. It's kind of his ruminations on um, that past. He says, as you can see, может быть, некоторые мои читатели усомнятся в действительности подобных событий на Украине, не поверят, что под правлением русским, right, under Russian rule, uh, могли проходить без наказания такие насилия, и все это припишет игре воображения, моего воображения, но нежели те редуты, развалины, again, ruins, развалины, uh, имена и легенды выросли сами собой, как грибы после дождя. Неужели воображение народное от нечего делать вымыслило понятие чуждой нынешнему быту поселян? Um, so he, he singles out the, that Russian rule, the guarantee of order, right? That, that supposedly would be somehow problematic. Um, um, that would make it problematic for his reader to, readers to imagine uh, that, that disorder in, in Ukraine 80 years ago. But he continues and, and explains that what happens in between is exactly the unification of the administrative structure of the Russian Empire and Catherine II, um, the dissolution of the siege and what he calls correct organization of its provinces, right? Uh, and the language here become, uh, kind of translated in a very clumsy way, but that's how his kind of style goes. And I think it probably reflects uh, some of his own discomfort and, and not also the language of homogenization, right? It's one thought. So after this chaos and this diversity, he also talks about various ethnic groups inhabiting Ukraine, Serbs and Greeks and Tartars and uh, Poles and so on. Uh, and then finally, um, at the end of the reign of Catherine the Great, or the second, um, Russia's con con concentrated on, 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 on its internal matters. One thought went through the entire state and gave something common to the ideas of the whole mass of the hetero hetero heterogeneous Ukrainian population so it become homogenized and brought to order right, by, by the Russian Empire. Um, so, as I already suggested, it's the ultimate colonial moment, this full absorption right, of Ukraine into the Russian Empire that constitutes the rupture between Kulish's present and the eight years ago and makes the Ukrainian past open to an imaginative reconstruction. And his evaluation of this rupture is highly ambivalent. As you can see, he seems to pray, embrace that um, homogenization, right, that, that reordering, that Ukraine uh, entering the civilizing, <laughs> civilized world right, of the Russian Empire, but also um, constantly invoking nostalgically that past that's lost, that the cost of that inclusion, right, of Ukraine into, into like what he sees as probably Western civilization. Uh, and one can probably wonder whether it was a concession to, to censorship. And I haven't looked close at this, but I suspect that this was his genuine dilemma because it's just really a consistent um, theme throughout his career, that vacillation uh, between that romantic nostalgic uh, invocation, romanticization of the past and the kind of uh, embracement of uh, yeah, Russian civilizing um, effects on, on, on Ukraine. Mm. Okay, and uh, so this is kind of one part of my analysis and I will not <laughs> dwell much longer, which deals uh, on the ruins and um, uh, intricate play of temporal temporalities that, that uh, create this ambivalent portrayal of Ukraine's past and present. And in, in the other half of my chapter or article, uh, which I will only briefly <laughs> allude to here, I deal with the, um, I, know, I examine his insertion of Gothic others into the novel. That's another interesting technique. It's also just fun <laughs> to read and think about, but it's also, I think, adds to that, uh, pro his problematic uh, picture of, of, of uh, Ukraine. Um, and its historical trajectory. So, and mainly we have that uh, converted Jew Krzyzanowski, whom I already mentioned, uh, who is recruited for the Imperial Army, uh, who also appears in other parts of Eastern Europe under different names, and whose cultural genealogy I trace in the apocryphal figure of the wandering Jew for various reasons. I have lots of evidence. <laughs> and basically, um, so he literally like takes Ukrainian youth from south to north, right? from uproots them 
uh, and takes him away from home. And uh, he represents, in my view, that exactly, not also the threat of conversion, which in the case of the uh, Uniat uh, kind of threat of the union of Catholic and, and, and Orthodox population was a very uh, prominent concern for, for Ukraine, but also more and more symbolic level. He's also very demonic force. He's, um, he's part of that supernatural Gothic layer of the novel. Um, he's ever been like, Katerina says, whenever he talks to him, I feel some uncanny sense of horror. And um, uh, his, his, his effect on the Ukrainian youth is described as almost magical, how he can just, you know, take, yeah, seduce them, exactly. And women as well. Uh, he actually pursues Katerina. Um, and um, yeah, so I think he represents that kind of danger of a rootless nomadic identity that also Mikhailov uh, uh, embodies right in the novel because he is that kind of traveler who leaves home, leaves his father, burns his house and sets on that questionable heroic quest uh, in service of the empire. So they kind of uh, uncannily mirror each other. And somebody pointed out to me that Chernyshenko, uh, the, 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 the root is black, right? Chernyshenko is in the protagonist's name that might reflect on uh, Krzyzanowski's uh, kind of demonism. Um, so, and on the other hand, we have this really fascinating portrayal of um, Serbs who hiding in Ukraine from the Ottoman Empire while, while plotting revenge and some kind of independence uh, project, like battle for independence project. Uh, and um, they're described in like super said, oriental uh, terms, like uh, they described Asiatic, bloodthirsty compared to animals, lions. Um, the girl is uh, has this kind of, uh, in, in the, kills Katerina in the fit of Asiatic jealousy. Uh, their main, um, guy, Ban, the same as Pan, is uh, um, compared to, uh, yeah, some kind of Eastern, they're often like mistaken for Turks, but they have an Orthodox cross, and there is, again, something uncanny and weird about them, because they're kind of like us, they sound like us, but not quite, their Ban is almost the same as Pan, they say, <laughs> they're, they're print, and Kulish adds a footnote that Ban means uh, prince, knyaz, in, in, in Serbian, um, it's almost like, <laughs> or, you know, but um, so they are very hard to place uh, ethnograph ethnically and uh, culturally. And uh, the um, one of the very um, successful actually here of the novel, successful artistically, uh, the, Parisian, the Parisian Cossack uh, Sherbina feels this absolute kind of strange affinity to the songs, a Serbian song he hears the, the girls sing. Um, so they're very exoticized on the one hand and yet made kind of semi-familiar and, and a lot of Serbian language in the novel. So um, I would say that they are meant to be portrayed as dark twins. So they can represent that destructive, um, irrational, right? Barbarian force exactly, exactly that uh, Kulish associates with the Parisian Cossacks, that kind of dark twins, the externalization of that problematic aspect of Ukrainian history that Kulish is kind of grappling with um, the wilder part of Ukraine, as it were. Okay, huh. uh, I won't talk about the cup, that is a lot of fun, but maybe in the <laughs> Q&A section, but I promised the title to talk a little bit about the reception of the novel, and I think it's very interesting, even though it's just basically um, um, a summary of what other people have said, but how this novel was perceived by Russian critics uh, at the time, I think is quite telling. Um, and it actually was quite a success. Um, most reviewers were positive, except for um, Library for Reading, Sinkovsky, and for Literaturna Gazeta by Nikrasov. So Kulish already had strong ties to Slavophiles, so he sent his novel to Pagodin, and Shevirov reviews the novel in Moskvitanin. Um, and um, he hails Kulish as a worthy heir of Gogol and Kvitkos Navyanenko, and quickly identifies the novel as a product of what he calls the Walter Scottian historical school, and praises the author for masterful reconstruction of the time period portrayed in the novel. And as the main idea of the novel, he, said, he, he highlights that of ancient little Russia whose historical time is left behind in the past. And the period in question um, is that of a transition from the military and have nomadic, nomadic way of life, a bit, 
to the civic and state one, which awaited Little Russia and its new unification with Russia. So very imperial, of course, reading of, of, of even though it's kind of positive, yeah, cool, we have new Google, <laughs> but yeah, it's good that you know that Ukraine is tamed and that was inevitable, right? And kind of in a way justified by by the novel zone. Um, message, except as I try to show, it's much more complex than that. And for Shabirov, this novel's protagonist, Mikhail, Mikhail Chernyshenko, is a typical represent, representative of this transition. He's a hero in whom obedience to the wise elder's advice to take up civic service clashed with the desire to seek military glory. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, a desire instigated both by instinct and the national tradition, as he says. So clearly, even the benevolent review um, guided by the logic of Russia's civilization and superiority and inevitability, almost inevitability of its uh, um, imperial <laughs> project. Um, the Son of the Fatherland publishes another positive review, which offers um, anonymous review, which offers a highly romanticized characterization of the Ukraine of the past that mixes idyllic and medieval romantic tropes. Ukraine is described as a poetic land under the bright sky and blessed with the benevolent climate and nature, but it's also the land of chivalry where landowners lived, I quote, like German knights in their castles. So again, this idea of uh, like Middle Ages that Russia didn't have, but Germany did and Ukraine did. Um, the reviewer's characterization of the period portrayed in Mikhail Chernyshenko reveals the same ambiguity, right, as we saw in Shevirov. It was, I quote, the epoch when great Russia fulfilling Peter the Great's idea according to the brotherly kinship was bringing the little Russia region closer and closer. Um, and this region, the author states, was separated from us by the hostile policies of Poland and Lithuania, but also by the South Russian people, not South, right? So Ukraine was viewed as the South Russia, uh, South Russian people's own free loving spirit. The, re the reviewer's sympathy for the imperial project is paradoxically combined with his romantic admiration for the Ukrainians' pursuit of national independence. As the critic nostalgically echoes Kulish's narrator, that was the last era of little Russian distinct life, some obitnesti. But what he finds irritating is Kulish's extensive use of Serbian as well as Ukrainian in the novel, which makes some passages of the work incomprehensible and turns the novel language into a bizarre mix. He says the Serbian words especially sound wildly dika to the ear. And indeed the language itself of the novel has an uncanny quality being familiar Russian um, and yet tainted by this foreign of still Slavic elements which clearly unsettled the novel's Russian imperial critics. Moving on to negative reviews, Nikrasov, that's that very Nikrasov in Literaturna Gazeta. Uh, he didn't do much of like ideological analysis of the novel. He just retold this, the plot of the novel in a kind of defamiliarized way as complete nonsense. He omitted any motivation using like Tolstoy and almost Pachimuta for some reason. Uh, this happened, this happened, but basically dismissed it as a cliche, as one of those chivalric and brigand fairy tales that are sold everywhere in Germany. And he mocks its poor style, um, even though he himself, for repetitions, he himself repeats hundreds and hundreds twice in his review, uh, but he, he doesn't really comment on its ideological implication or historical assertions. And then the favorite list. The favorite is Sienkowski's Library for Reading. Um, did not was not signed by Sienkowski, but it's clearly his. It, it echoes a lot of his other uh, attacks on, on Ukrainian, various Ukrainian history, the histories that were published at the time. So it's not only the most scathing evaluation of the novel, but also the most unapologetically colonial assessment of Ukrainian history. The reviewer mocks above all that very idea that Shiverov found so central in, to the to the novel, Sobstinaj is Malarosi, that uh, Little Russia's unique or distinct life. Uh, he narrates, Sinkowski narrates his own version of this imaginary unique life as essentially the degeneration of the once great Prince Dunk, Ivan Rus, which after the Tatar Mongol invasion turns into a des desert or a steppe. This desert eventually becomes a colony of Lithuania comparable to Haiti. He literally compares <laughs> Ukraine to Haiti. Um, then the province of Lithuania and is ultimately reduced to the status of a Hetman's estate. Cossacks, whose etymology he mockingly traces to wild geese or Kazaki Gusaki, um, emerge in his description not as noble Ukrainian knights fighting for the Orthodox faith and not as romantic free spirited rebels, but as a bunch of gangsters ravaging the land. This gang is finally brought to enlightenment, civil society, and order by Peter the Great, according to Sienkowski, uh, who de facto ended the Hetman at autonomy and liberated, liberated oof, little Russia from the yoke of the wild army. 
uh, I need to double check if you use that word actually, because again, it's eerily um, contemporary. Along with this unsympathetic view of both the author's overall project and Ukrainian history more generally, Sienkowski ruthlessly and somewhat justly criticizes Kulish's predilection for romantic cliches, including almost done, Gothic tropes. The critic mockingly describes the Serbs dwelling, for example, which is kind of this Gothic tower in the, in the dwelling and in a cave as the Radcliffean cave of Ukraine, uh, referring to Anne Radcliffe, the prominent English uh, author of uh, Gothic novels, Gothic novels. And then he uh, in the very presence of the Serbs in the novel and in Ukraine, he interprets as yet another proof of the chaos and disorder characteristic of Ukraine before its full incorporation to the Russian empire. I quote, such was little Russia's unique life, ha ha ha, right? Sobstvena reason. Whoever wanted could settle there and acted as if he was the master of the house. Apart from a romantic or slavophile admiration of Ukrainian poetic history, um, Sienkowski's vision of the imaginary Gothic Ukraine of the past depicts it as a dark realm of chaos, statelessness, and barbarism. It is a shapeless land without a clear institutional and geographical structure, a desert roamed by criminals, a house without a master. No less chaotic, according to Sienkowski, is the language of the novel, I quote. Without respect for the language in which he is writing, the author peppers his style with little Russian and Serbian conversations, which makes the reading for Russian both uninteresting and difficult. Nivesila i skushna. Sorry, nivesila i trudna. Clearly troubled by Kulish's Gothic Ukraine, Sienkowski creates an alternative narrative of the Russian Empire as the true master that is, that, that, that is able to give its chaotic neighbor shape and order, a narrative that still keeps hold on the Russian historical imagination. I'll stop here. Thank you. I have many, many questions. I'm not sure if I, um, is, is it okay if I just ask and, and in the meantime, others will- yeah, Of course, of yeah, course, yeah. you deserve. Um, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so many, <laughs> in fact that I, uh, I, I will just begin with, mm -hmm. a, with a very basic question, which is a historical question, mm -hmm. which is, there was this really interesting debate between Kostamarov and um, mm -hmm. Pagodin right, mm -hmm. on the origin of mm -hmm. uh, on the origin of Russia, on the whole Varangian mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay. legend. Right? Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering where was um, right where Kostamarov mm -hmm. famously claims mm -hmm. that the origin is not um, mm -hmm. uh, Varangian. But rather, or rather, it's Arangian, right? But the, mm -hmm. the uh, roots of this are not um, are not um, Vikings, but Lithuanian, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And 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 and, mm -hmm. and also indirectly Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so, so right there, um, uh, with that comes the idea that Russia is originally and paradigmatically republican rather mm -hmm. than. Uh, monarchist uh -huh. and uh -huh. and so on. So I was just wondering whether Kulish was around at the time. So mm -hmm. this is this would have been I'm afraid to mistake this, but I, I would think fifty nine or sixty. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And if he if you know yeah, of his exactly. responses or reactions or participation in this debate, I don't actually. Unfortunately, I I'm not. A even though it sounds like maybe I've worked on Kulish, but I'm not like a Kulish, big Kulish, a Kulish scholar yet. I might dig more into him. Uh, and it's funny, kind of, because I did work, I have an article on Beringen, the theories of Beringen, um origin, but more in the late 18th century. And I've talked about Kostomar here, but I'm not so well familiar with his take on the position. Um, I've probably, the, so, um, in his polemics with Sienkowski, he actually always rejected this Lithuanian origin of Ukrainians because he felt like Sienkowski makes us all Poles. He wrote to Pagodin angrily. He was very, I don't know what was happening in the late 50s, but in the 40s, which I focused on, he was kind of obsequious to Pagodin. He really wanted to gain his um, favors. He wanted to publish in Moskvitanian. Um, when he was exiled, he wrote back to him again saying, um, such a horrible thing happened to me. Can, can you send me a journal? I'd like to continue being, uh, you know, inspired by your wonderful. So he was more kind of insane. I want to respond to Sinkovsky. He makes on uh, but it's not the case. And he kind of 
at that time in the 40s, he's not a fan of the Lithuanian uh, Polish provenance. Um, I would need to look into the later works uh, in the later period to see yeah, if he contributed. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Such an, uh, you know, the Cyril and the Thodius and the connection to Kastamar. Of course. Um, I suppose that mm -hmm. he would be on his side, but then, of course, later the turn mm -hmm. towards a kind of imperialism, right? To, would sort of contradict that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, probably later, he would not be. I have a question mm -hmm, here mm -hmm. on, so that I don't take up too much, mm -hmm, too much time. In this mm -hmm. case, I have a question from Sibyl and Forrest. Uh -huh. And the question reads as follows uh, How much would Kulish have known about the history of Scotland as opposed to the novels of Walter Scott? Mm -hmm. Because there are lots of cultural and linguistic parallels between the positions of Scotland and of Ukraine. Just as you said. Mm -hmm. Huh. Good question. He definitely knew Walter Scott. He read him in French translations. Um, oh, I should, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and he did a very serious research of Ukrainian ethnography, how much he knew the actual history of Scotland. Um, he, he had an interest in, interest in Scotland, for sure. Um, I think he was familiar with it. But of course, Walter Scott was the primary literary source. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the parallel is still there. You don't need even to know anything about Scottish history to infer from Waverly, right? That there's so much. I mean, Scott's writes an introduction. He writes a conclusion that's more theoretical about his project. And but interestingly, I, I talk a bit more about it in the, in the chapter. There's for all the similarities. There is a difference in their position. Scott steps out of that. He, he really accept that break. He really accepts the rupture. For him, it's it's sealed. His novel, right, the, the, he abandons the cause of the Highlanders, returns home. That cup that I didn't get to talk about, the cup, magic cup, is found and restored. Yeah. And in Kulish, it's lost. It's Doroshenko's Charka, the headman from the ruin period. And actually, the ending of the novel is not all this horrible death of various characters, but like I'm a kind of playful some metal literary ending, I would like to know the most what happened to the Doroshenko, Doroshenko Charka, and it has an inscription on it. He kind of, it's, it's a lost and found ad. And, and the uh, novel ends here as if it's still an open ending possibility, as if this Charka can be found and the old glory can still be uh, reenacted somehow. So it's more, more um, ambiguous, I think, than in, 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 in Scott. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's another question mm -hmm. uh, from, I'm sorry, and Emily, Emily Wan, who mm -hmm. I, I just saw the question that came before. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for the talk. I wanted to ask Valeria to elaborate on the analogy uh, Sinkowski makes between Haiti and Ukraine. What are the racial implications of that analogy? What does it mean for Ukraine's status as a more familiar other from a Russian perspective than the Caucasus uh, that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk? <laughs> Thank you. Great question. Um, I can quickly look. I, I don't think he elaborates from what I remember. I have a copy of the whole review. Uh, he, he doesn't elaborate on the analogy. I think he wants to shock the reader. He wants to, this is kind of the shortcut to this. This is a colony. This is Haiti. Uh, it's just the same. Um, so, uh, but it's, it, I mean, he was himself an Orientalist, right? Literally, <laughs> Tinkovsky specialist in Orient language. So he's interested in, in all this, um, right? Issues of other races and other uh, cultures, implications. Um, it's a great question. I probably should have thought about it more. I was just excited to see that <laughs> as a kind of that really unabashedly colonial reference, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it implies inferiority, right? Definitely, given the racial hierarchies of the 19th century, if you compare Ukraine to Haiti, then just, you know, it, it immediately connotes a bunch of tropes, right? Of, uh, you know, backwardness and development, right? The kind of uh, justifies the, the, the colonizing and uh, effort and the civilization mission. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it does give a racial uh, ring to, to, to Zinkowski's reading of And the wild geese, right? The kind of animal uh, imagery, Kazaki, uh, Kazaki Gusaki, uh, is just, yeah, extremely dismissive at, at various levels. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's not a very sophisticated answer, but I'm so confused. Is following this up, 
mm -hmm. of this, mm -hmm. the observation that Haiti, uh, but Haiti also had a successful revolution, which fits with Ukraine's freedom uh -huh. and reputation. Right? Excellent. So yeah, that's... thank you. I should have thought about it. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One, I wonder if they were, mm -hmm. they were kind of keeping this in mind. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, yeah, yeah, I should definitely think about it more. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, since uh, no further questions are coming right now, mm -hmm. I I will turn to another one. Okay, right? of course. Mm -hmm. um, with your permission, one of this, uh, one of one of which is actually kind of involved mm -hmm. by, by um, Emily mm -hmm. Emily's question, which is that. Um, Ukraine and the Caucasus. Mm -hmm. right? so, um, so you have Shevchenko's mm -hmm. uh, Kafkas, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which is a uh, kind of, uh, which involves, I think, a certain kind of identification right? mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. the Caucasus and, yeah. Yeah. And, and Ukraine. Do we have the Caucasian motifs in, mm -hmm. in Kulish at all, given the romanticism? Mm -hmm. Not that I can, not in Chernorade, not, not in novels. Right. I don't know, like he wrote so much. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's more like South Slavs is his big um, kind of other. That there is also Chernogorian uh, character, Montenegro character in Chernorada, uh, which is actually this, this, the second novel is devoid, basically, of right. gothic, most Gothic uh, tropes. Uh, yeah, and as you say, those are the, the, sort of the dark, mm -hmm. shadowy side yeah. of the Ukrainian national, yeah. as opposed to mm -hmm. the bright, freedom-loving twins <laughs> of the Ukrainian. Oh, the Cossacks, I don't know, the Parisian, that they're more like domesticated, right? Um, I can think of any. Um, Again, I would need to probably go back and uh, read more his works, but no, not I don't. And um, I think he was, oh, well, he was really, I mean, the whole Cyril Methodius Brotherhood was pan-Slavic, right? And it's a yeah. uh, program, even though Shevchenko is also part of it, but uh, Kulish, I think is more interested in uh, this um, kind of the place of Ukraine and this map of like Slavic peoples possibly in the both symbolic and <laughs> more literal mm, and uses this and actually some some reviewers find it that it was a very uh very successful technique to uh compare ukrainians to to other slavs as opposed mm -hmm. to russians right to kind of the kind of gradation of uh you know slavness <laughs> and so on uh that seems to be the case um, uh, this is a, a question from Anne Lansbury. Mm -hmm. She says, sorry, meant to put a question here. Very general question. Can you talk a bit more about images of Poland in the material you're looking at? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, huh. so uh, Poles are evil. Uh, and that's pretty much so. Um, this Historia Rusev, uh, Historia Rusev, Ilimala Resi, that was the kind of... Uh, the text that circulated as uh, was kind of a mystification a bit uh, at the time, but was extremely influential. So the narrative that was kind of the, the uh, more pro-imperial narrative that, of course, being under Poland and being seduced by Poland or Lithuania was the aberration, right? Of and that's exactly what's still <laughs> being told now: aberration from this path of Ukraine's union with the East Slavdom, right? With, with Russia uh, and so on. Um, so Poland is negative uh, in the novel at, at various levels. Krzyżanowski, the Jew, right, has a Polish last name, uh, and he's a convert. Sveje Perichres so is kind of uh, it's also he's also the character from from that his chronicle, that history of the Rus. Uh, and Krzyż means cr cross, right? So he's kind of that uh, uh, deceptive Christian who's hiding a Jew behind, but also hiding the threat, right? And uh, Unia. Uh, comes up a lot. And that was, of course, the main uh, threat from Poland was, and in general, uh, the figure of the wandering Jew in the European, the European tradition often embodied that uh, kind of fear in England, for example, of conversion. Yeah. And uh, uh, Breska Unia, right, was uh, signed uh, where in those territories, 
when Ukraine and Belarus were right under a Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth that uh, created its union church, right, with the elements of orthodoxy and, and Catholicism could coexist. And it's seen by Kulish, uh, at least in the novel, uh, as that kind of ultimate threat of a ca Catholic threat. So Poles and Jews appear actually equally bad uh, as uh, presenting that and it kind of merge in the Krzyzanowski figure, <laughs> right, as uh, there's explicit um, kind of monologues in, in the novel about how the Unia came back, that Krzyzanowski came back, how many, uh, how much can we uh, deal with that uh, kind of treacherous attempt to, to convert us and they're so bad. So Poland, Poland is negative, Poland is uh, trying to um, get Ukrainians away from their orthodox uh, identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Taras Bulba. Uh, yeah, and of course. Would you like to add? <laughs> you, I saw yeah, I just had a very quick follow-up question to that, which is mm -hmm. really interesting. Um, I've been looking at later 19th century Russian texts um, where, uh, where you can see this kind of uh, blurring of Jews, Poles, and even Germans um, it, it is, as images of sort of petit bourgeois, Michadsky vices. And um, I'm wondering if this is you know, in this this sort of like mixing of Jewishness and Polishness that mm -hmm. you're seeing here, is this something really different? Um, or could there be connections there? Um, it is a bit different because Krzyzanowski is much more of a kind of demonic uh, yeah. figure than this kind of petty, uh, you know, uh, business uh, enterprising Jew. But in the uh, history of the Rus, uh, there is this uh, line that says, uh, that he capitalized that uh, at the time of the crisis, the most um, characteristic feature of a nation comes to the fore. And for Jews, it's the uh, passion for accumulation or for profit. And for Ukrainians, it's that military uh, kind of the, their propensity for military heroism. So it seems like Krzyzanowski literally like capitalizes on that Ukrainian, but by luring those young Ukrainian Cossacks into the army, he capitalizes. <laughs> on that uh, national, like, he gets paid for it. And so capitalizes, yeah, again, literal and figurative, but he also uh, exploits, ah, again, the Jewish trope, you know, this anti-Semitic trope, exploits that Ukrainian kind of spontaneous, uh, uh, you know, na national feature. So, it's, uh, and, and there's so much supernatural language there that is, so the only reference, yeah, to that exploitative and more, materialistic aspect of, of Jewishness is only here, but it's not even in the novel, it's in the source. Uh, and there is kind of a concern at the end about uh, consumerism when he talks about that charka, that cup that disappeared, and maybe it's already uh, forged or, you know, uh, it in something else and it's sold somewhere as a teapot, a coffee pot, and we'll never find it. So it's a, again as if a metaphor of Ukraine, right, being uh, the, the sort of this heroic grand uh, ruin right, of the past. It's a uh, kind of so Ukraine entered that Russian modernity, right? But at what cost? So maybe uh, there is this transformation of that moment of glory, but we never find out. But it's not associated with Jews or Poles at the end. So very. Almost not, none here yet, but th there is some, yeah, in the sources we see some of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's more romantic, it's more romantic kind of demonization it's still at that point because it's still pretty early. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, one more thing. And I think because that's why, because the, the prototype for Krzyzanowski's Wandering Jew, um, that he acquires like more metaphysical, right? Um, Characteristics than than just some petty Jew from uh, it was bourgeois Jew. Mm -hmm. He has this kind of uncanny power. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah, I have another mm -hmm. question. Um, yeah, so um, this this issue of the inevitability of the empire is I found extremely interesting. Uh -huh. and, and, right, you understand what that? Yeah, is, yeah, yeah. You mean in the critics or in the in general or in, in the critics' in, responses? In the text as well, right? Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. uh, and and it made me think, uh, yeah. and again, this is where the Caucasus question actually mm -hmm, came out mm -hmm. of. Made me think of the prisoner of the Caucasus, uh -huh. obviously, right? Where mm -hmm. there is a similar dynamic of, mm -hmm. on the one hand, idealization mm -hmm. and and sort of marveling at the mm -hmm. beauty of these freedom loving yeah. people, and yeah. on the other hand, the praise for their conquest, genocidal, <laughs> their mall, mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and, and the rest. Mm -hmm. right? 
and the idea that it's uh, of course inevitable and and quite simple right and 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 the idea of uh, primirenius, right, as a, as a word primirenius, this which mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. empire mm -hmm. and civilization. And then, you know, the bronze horseman, mm -hmm. right, a similar kind of thing, right, something is not, I mean, something is haunting, mm -hmm. right, uh, something is there from those elements that have been suppressed and ordered and so on, yeah, yeah. but it, it kind of breaks out. Mm -hmm. So is there, do you feel like, yeah, so there, I guess there are two questions here. One question is how much of this is a part of what kind of Russian mm -hmm. romantic, um, how to put it, imaginary? Mm -hmm. And uh, so broadly Russian. You mean then with the end of the Ukraine, to, yeah. Where mm -hmm. Ukraine is just, you know, might as well be the Caucasus, might as well uh -huh, be the uh -huh, uh -huh. uh, And then how, uh, and then how much, you know, in, in this context, what's interesting is I think the difference seems to be, I'm just think, kind mm -hmm. of thinking out loud, but, but it's mm -hmm. still a question. <laughs> the difference seems to be that the, mm -hmm. the elemental, the thing that is suppressed and overcome uh -huh. is now identified with the nation, right? Um, which is itself a weird thing because the nation is an extremely modern. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, 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 phenomenon, mm -hmm, although mm -hmm. it conceives of itself, of course, is very ancient. And, and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so that the, the, the creation of the nation, on mm -hmm. the one hand, is frankly more modern than empire, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it turns out the nation itself turns out to be somehow more archaic, and the empire turns out to be more modern than the nation. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So there's this kind of strange. Yeah, kind of that's great. Yeah. Thing that's mm -hmm. I don't have an answer, but I have two thoughts, maybe in connection. First of all, Pushkin too, right? Uh, inevitability of the Empire. Caucasus was far from conquered when he was writing the epilogue, but he presents this as an absolute certainty, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the second is this actually in my Finland cha Finland's chapter I talk about uh, Odoevsky's um, uh, uh, Salamandra. Mm -hmm. Salamandra, where exactly this uh, Petersburg myth is kind of very questioned strongly when uh, that conquered Finnish territory. Uh, in which the cradle of like, Russian Western civilized right, uh, society of the center of Petersburg is built, comes back with vengeance in the figure of that Finnish girl who also becomes kind of a sorcerer of Salamandra and she wreaks uh, havoc uh, everywhere. And also there is material of the flood, material of the fire. Uh, and I think, um, so I think that there, there are some Russian authors really uh, question that uh, inevitability, yeah. right? And the Russian modernity, right? And the, and, and the, um, the cost of it, but um, the interplay of nation is archaic and modern thing is super interesting but yeah it seems like for them the empire presents modernity more right in a weird twist it's, it's yeah right? because we are mm -hmm. in the middle of romantic nationalism yeah historic, you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if we understand it mm -hmm. in, and you can broadly european terms right uh, the ukrainian nation is a yeah. most recent yeah thing that yeah is. that's really interesting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But somehow, yeah, it's in the past. It's it's always a hist in this discourse. This nation is always like fin Finns or Ukrainians are described actually in very similar terms. They're always a historical, childlike, right? Uh, this kind of romantic primitivism, primitivism kicks in, right? Living in this uh, kind of uh, idyllic or um, separated from civilization, right? And uh, so I think it it has to do with the romantic, you know, yearning for that. Uh, natural right origin the, the um mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. yeah yes it's part of that mm -hmm. so i have uh thank you valeria from from sibling forster and i have <laughs> valeria thanks so much for your talk from catherine bowers thank you three little notes <laughs> <laughs> yes C catherine and i go back yes. <laughs> <It's> gothic <laughs> connection catherine. yes mm -hmm. thank you Dara, uh, and thank you Dara, for superb talk and the way I had found your ideas about the uncanny and the narrowness of Ukraine within the Russian mm -hmm. period, um, tradition to be extremely generative. And I very much second that. Thank you. And thank you. I mean, uh, not the first to talk about it, but I kind of pushed <laughs> it. Maybe more. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm.
Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you all so much. Um, thank you very much. And, uh, for listening. Thank you for, for everybody mm -hmm. who's here. For the great questions that I didn't always answer. <laughs> but that's part of fun. <laughs>